From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Spring is sprung, and that's putting Java apps at risk. Precursor malware may be a sign you're about to get ransomware. And Apple and Meta leak user data to hackers posing as the police. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we're about to get some insight, opinion, and definitely some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Frederick Lee, the CISO at Gusto. Flea, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. All right. Before we get into the conversation, we want to thank our sponsor, Veronis Zero Trust, Zero Damage. Of course, you can join us on LinkedIn Live to do so. Go to CISOseries.com, look for that week in review page, and you can find the link there. We won't wait for you, though. We've got about 20 minutes, so we're going to jump right into it. Our first story of the day, remote code execution flaws in Spring and Spring Cloud Frameworks put Java apps at risk. This development has sparked fears that it could have a widespread impact across enterprise environments, since Spring is one of the most popular open source frameworks for developing Java applications. The flaw, which has since been dubbed Spring Shell or Spring 4 Shell, I don't know who's doing the dubbing, but let's make a decision, people, is a high-severity RCE, which has apparently was apparently released as a proof-of-concept exploit on GitHub by a Chinese developer and then removed. So Flea, uh, this has all the warning sounds of another log 4 j uh, What's your take on this vulnerability? I, I think you're exactly right with regards to actually some of the similarities between Log4j. Uh, you know, remote code execution is probably like one of the scariest things we actually think about. And one of the more interesting things is because this is spring-based, this is one of those areas where we often as enterprises actually just forget about what we have in our infrastructure. Uh, there is a bright side to this, which is because everybody just went through the log for J fire drill, then a lot of people have much more <laughs> insight into like the assets. And I think a lot of people actually just forget about how prolific Java was. But fundamentally, if you are doing the right thing from an asset management standpoint, from a bone management standpoint, ideally, this should be easy for people to react to. But we should always expect that there's going to be zero days. And we as an industry just have to be prepared for that. Is there any concern for like a like this is another example of a proof of concept just kind of seemingly accidentally or, or for a short time getting out there? Is that uh, I, I guess what what how what is the threat level for that or what is the. Uh, is this going to be something that we're going to see more common, I guess? Um, you know, actually, I think we might see it more commonly. You know, some of the things that we used to do, and I want to say we, like the industry and, and, and hackers, et cetera, things that we used to have that were underground and our like se exclusive security knowledge is now just broad developer knowledge. And, and, and so we should expect that we're going to see more of these things roll out. And sometimes not even people even recognizing that it's a security exploit and, and, and effectively developers trying to be innovative on their own and finding <laughs> essentially these opportunities inside of code bases and especially some of these legacy stacks. And, and I'm, I'm a Java lover, but there's a lot of historical knowledge around Java that people have just kind of lost and now modern developers are actually rediscovering some of those things. And so you think about like Log4j, for example, you know, a lot of our newer, you know, developers, et cetera, had no insight about what JNDI even did. And, you know, and so we kind of lost some of that knowledge and now developers are rediscovering it and rediscovering also ways to exploit that uh, on the more malicious side. All right, moving on to our next story, precursor malware infection may be a sign you're about to get ransomware. Lumu Technologies founder and CEO Ricardo Villaduega suggests that per precursor malware, essentially reconnaissance of uh, malicious code, lays the groundwork for a full ransomware campaign to come. Campaigns that can find and remediate that precursor malware can theoretically ward off a ransomware attack, at least according to Ricardo. He's based his statements on a study of more than 2,000 companies that Lumu monitors, in which every ransomware attack came with an another malware preceding it and paving the way. Lumu collected information uh, such as aspects about things like DNS queries, network flows, access logs, firewalls, and proxies, and correlates the data to identify whether any asset is trying to contact an adversarial infrastructure. A better way to operate, at least according to Ricardo, is by assuming we're compromised and let your network prove otherwise. So, Flea, assuming you're already compromised, kind of a, a maybe some some emerging uh, common wisdom here. Uh, but does this discovery make sense to you? Shouldn't this have been discovered a while ago? Uh, yeah, I mean, it should have been discovered a while ago, right? And, 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 it's, <laughs> and I think it's kind of a, a no-brainer. And, and totally agree that assume compromise is just the way that modern infrastructure has to work now. 
Um, and and mm-hmm. especially recognizing that it's a you know asymmetrical game, right? But you know, from us as defenders versus attackers, um, the the analogy I like to think about that this made me think you know uh, drew me to immediately was hey malware is like finding a mole on your skin, and it's like hey okay you should probably go to the doctor if it's actually a new mole because this could form into something truly cancerous in, in, in the you know form of, of malware in this case. And, and I think it's one of the things that people actually kind of lost sight about. Like there's no such thing as a minor intrusion to your infrastructure. That, that, so once somebody has some kind of residence, then you have to actually dive a little bit deeper. And this is essentially just the same game of just general attacker reconnaissance. Like, yeah, you know, you, you want to be able to actually see, can I actually put something here? Can I actually have it communicate outside the network now? Okay, now I can actually start launching a more advanced campaign with much higher stakes. Yeah, and it seems like with the emphasis now on like lurk times when it comes to ransomware, I mean, this seems to be all part of that game of, you know, how much long, you know, whether it's, you know, quote unquote, the ransomware operators inside the network, or it's a malware campaign that's preceding it, it's still, ad- again, additional recon that they can do to do more damage when the the actual attack comes, right? Oh, yeah. And, and, and I think it's just, we, we've just driven the cost down so much that it makes it super easy for attackers. All right, well, moving on, one of the uh, big stories of this week, Apple and Meta leak user data to hackers posing as police. This is coming from Bloomberg, and they say that the tech giants fell prey to a phishing operation that tricked employees into handing over customer data to cyber criminals posing as law enforcement. We're talking about things like IP addresses, addresses, and the like. In 2021, the hacker sent fake emergency data requests to companies demanding customer info and included forged signatures from police officers. Allison Nixon, a chief research officer at Unit 221B, commented, in every instance where these companies messed up at the core, there was a person trying to do the right thing. Now, for some context, ordinarily law enforcement needs a court-ordered warrant or subpoena to provide this information. However, emergency data requests can be submitted without court approval in cases of imminent harm. Uh, As part of a wider piece on this trend of EDR abuse, Brian Krebs reports that there's basically no way for platforms to determine if requests are legitimate, assuming they're coming from a police email address that's already kind of trusted. No surprise that these tactics for obtaining uh, EDT were offered uh, for sale on the dark web and abused by major against major tech platforms so you know flea uh seems to be no end of ways to kind of fool people uh with this you know whether you want to call this phishing or or whatever you want to you know spoofing whatever you want to call this and in this case not even a reflexive click right it's someone thinking hey this is a case of imminent harm even if i am suspicious about this the the implications of being wrong about that could have life-threatening uh impacts here uh you know how are we supposed to stop this, this source of impersonation scam yeah, this is going to be a very controversial take for, for, for me, um, and, and, and definitely the audience may not agree with it. Um, law enforcement is supposed to be hard. Uh, so, and, 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 and no, it, it is. And this idea mm-hmm. that, hey, you know, the, the police, and obviously you can tell by how I'm dressed that maybe, you know, my, my political spectrum. But, uh, yeah, law enforcement is supposed to be hard. The police are supposed to show up with lots of data, and they are supposed to make an extraordinarily convincing argument, even in those cases where they claim this uh, you know, risk of extraordinary harm. Companies need to stop selling out their customers and need to stop selling out just the general population of Earth. Um, and what that means is that, yeah, there should be friction. There should be a lot of intentionality at Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, for any of these law enforcement requests. And they should view themselves as custodians of that customer data and that they are there. And their primary job is to protect their customers and the users on their platform, not to be an augmented service for the police. The police have an infinite budget. Let them go build this themselves. I, I do. I, I do have some sympathy for the person that gets that request oh, at oh, Facebook yeah. because if if you don't have that institutional backup from Facebook to deny that, you know, if this doesn't meet, you know, whatever where framework you have, and you feel like you could personally be on the hook for for something like that, I, I do have sympathy for that. In terms of a, a technical solution, is there any way to? I, I don't know. Is there any way to go beyond? Like, doesn't it seem like email yeah. as the as the gateway to providing yeah, this information is a, is a big problem? <laughs> yeah, like you know, there's a lot of things that we can actually improve technically. You know, especially <laughs> it's like, oh, well, yeah, like you know, why why don't we force the feds to have digital signatures and trusted keys and things that they have to sign before they actually show up mm-hmm. with email, etc. I don't care if they're technically illiterate; they need to start being literate. Right. It's like, yeah, then otherwise just stop being law enforcement. It, it, it's pointless at that point. Um, so so I, well, I, and I, I, I in. Oh, excuse me. In Krebs's report, he did note that there are like 18 over 18,000 police uh, uh, departments in the U.S. alone. So yep. it's like, 
again, it's the, one of those has to fail one time yep. for them to be able to abuse that. So yep. it, it seems it, like that's a problem. It, it needs to be a really high bar. And, and I actually also agree with you that it's unfair to start pointing fingers at some of these individuals that are literally just trying to do their job and they're trying to mm -hmm. do the right thing. Um, and yeah, somebody showing up in person, like as humans, we want to help. And so it's it's easy to you know manipulate somebody and you know to release this kind of data. And what's better is for us to actually build better infrastructure and systems such that nobody is ever put in that position to actually make a mistake. And and, and we know ways to solve this, right? Like when we think about money moving, like somebody at Facebook or you know any of the other companies, <laughs> they can't just send a massive ACH without a lot of clearance. A lot, even in emergencies, there's going to be two to three people to actually process that, etc. We have to start tr treating humans data with the same respect and care that we treat dollars and yeah maybe that doesn't jive well with the uh, capitalistic silicon valley but it jives well with us actually being decent humans and, and yeah and it's probably time for some of these companies to actually step up and start being decent humans as opposed to just greedy capitalists um i, I have a long rant about that but that's <laughs> for, for, for another podcast all right. Well, before we move on, we want to spend a few moments and thank our sponsor, Veronis, for their support of the show. From the words of a Veronis customer, the first time we got hit with ransomware, it took us weeks to recover. The second time we got hit, it took us two hours. Why? Because we had Veronis. Veronis reduces the ransomware blast radius and monitors our most important data automatically. Hear more at veronis.com slash CISO series. All right, moving on to another story that involves abusing, uh, uh, you know, systems that are meant to be trusted here. Scammers abuse Facebook's media partner portal. So more bad news for Facebook here. Motherboard <laughs> shared that some scammers are using the media partner portal in an attempt to verify accounts on Facebook and Instagram, as well as claim inactive usernames. The portal is meant to provide a streamlined way for media outlets to resolve issues with Facebook accounts, including things like helping with doxing and harassment or challenge content removals. Motherboard reports that Upwork and other freelance hiring sites contain multiple listings of people with ac uh, looking for people with access to the media partner portal to verify accounts. So, you know, kind of a, a very similar story in terms of bad actors abusing uh, these pipelines, uh, in this case, media related, not law enforcement related. Uh, but these threat actors are like water. They're always going to find a way in when it comes to the biggest and wealthiest Internet companies in the world continuing to get caught seems like like how you know what, what how do the rest of us kind of deal with that i guess uh, I, I don't even want to say should we be sympathetic to facebook in this but should consumers demand more from a company that's profited here from the very thing that's being stolen no, no and, and and i think it's the latter statement that, that people have to lean into and and we mm -hmm. as as uh, and it's interesting that, that, that we say consumers I, I, I would tell you that facebook uh you know members are employees or not employees <laughs> but rather a product of, of facebook and, and maybe users of the platform. And, and I think, you know, as mm -hmm. somebody who is, oh, if you're a Facebook user, et cetera, you should vote with your digital feed. Get off Facebook. If they continue to refuse to be respectful of the people's data that you have on there, especially because we're, they're monetizing that, then there has to be a higher bar and, and there, there has to be a lot more scrutiny. And they really do have to, you know, really improve those things because of who they, they claim their customers are. Um, I think that there's always the, you know, a bias there on, on Facebook side because they're just looking, hey, what is the easiest, quickest method there? I don't know if Facebook has the right incentives outside of people just quitting Facebook. It, in terms of uh, the one thing that stood out to me for this, I, I, I do agree with you completely on that. But the one thing that stood out with me on this is to see it on Upwork and like legit platforms. Like I would assume this is not common, but I would expect to hear, oh, this was on a hacker forum somewhere. But like, this is like, hey, you're gonna get hired for this job and you're gonna get a tax documentation to pay us for using this portal uh, that you have access to. It seems a little bizarre to me. It tells me how commonplace it probably is. Well, I mean, it's just the further democratization of technology, right? Um, and and, and then, you, know, you know, you have to remember, you know, what's illegal in the United States isn't necessarily legal ever elsewhere on the planet. So globalization, you know, hey, there, there's globalization at work for you and, you know, breaking down barriers and making sure that information flows freely on the Internet. Um, you know, and, and the big issue there, though, is, is does Upwork have a responsibility to, to guard for these kind of things? I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like the responsibility primarily falls on Facebook and, and they should be the ones because they know about this and they have the resources to know about it. It's a matter of how seriously they want to treat, you know, humans data. Our next story lapses shows that not all MFA is created equal. 
Security people have been pushing the MFA message, beating that drum for, <laughs> I don't know, forever now. But recently, Lapsus and APTs like Nobelium have been using a technique known as MFA prompt bombing to get around some MFA protections. This involves spamming an end user's legitimate device with push notification authentication prompts until the user just gives up and accepts the authentication, giving the attackers then access to another account. This is not a new or novel approach. Children do that their parents on a daily basis, but it is effective. Parents are suggesting, or experts, not parents, probably parents also would suggest, <laughs> but experts are suggesting using FIDO2 compliant MFA, which not impervious to this approach, at least prevents one device from giving access to a different one. Uh, you know, even though MFA is like the prevailing wisdom that like table stakes recommendation still is kind of hard to get buy in from the average user. But now we're we're kind of upping the stakes and saying, OK, we're going to have to you know make this, you know, is is it going to be even harder now if FIDO2 needs to be the standard for security? Or is this, again, kind of a micro segmentation of, all right, some MFA is better than no MFA. FIDO2 is better than phone based app MFA. Like, is is that the spectrum we're on with this? I think it's a combination of both. It's going to be the spectrum of protection and things that people actually care about, right? Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I care a lot more about protecting my bank account than I care about, uh, you know, random, you know, Reddit account and, and kitty, you know, websites, right? <laughs> um, so, so, you know, that's actually one aspect of it. But, but I think that we as a security community have to stop being so arrogant um, and, and, and recognize that security must have usability. And, and, and we've actually seen people actually do a good job with this. Like, you know, Apple, I always, you know, hold them up as an interesting example when they introduced Touch ID, which is actually was great MFA and great protection on phones. And they did it in a way that users actually embraced it. It's kind of like this thing that we talk about a lot of uh, about this, you know, this concept of lovable security. And, and, and I think on the MFA side, we can actually do that. You can actually make MFA enjoyable for people. And, and, and a lot of things in FIDO2 help it helps you accomplish that. So yeah, we just have to, you know, really lean in on the industry side, figure out how to actually make this more usable and users do respond. People care about security. People are technically savvy enough to be able to utilize good MFA. We just have to actually meet our end users where they actually are and stop pretending that we're trying to force them to become security experts and zealots all of a sudden. Give them more things like Touch ID, um, more things that actually can help with protection and things like that and make that shift away. And also give them more ways to essentially self-report on security concerns. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that we've been failing at also in the industry is really helping put the user in the driver's seat of their security and their risk destination. That's a really interesting point about some reporting stuff because yeah, the uh, the idea of hey, I noticed something, but literally I have I'm, I'm in a large organization, I have no pipeline for how to do that, and I don't want to create more work for myself. Like I, I as an employee, I totally get that response as well. Um, but it also interesting to think of MFA challenges as like a design challenge rather than like a technical one at this point in terms of user adoption. Yeah. Like that's a fascinating way to look at it. No, it, it, because it is right. It, it, it's not that we don't know, like we don't, we know the math, right? Like we literally know the math about how to actually solve this. Um, and, and, and we know the right al algorithms, et cetera. We know it actually makes some of these, like a lot of these things really, really resilient, but we haven't made them usable. And the key to making security truly effective is to make security lovable and make it in such a manner such that our users prefer to use that mechanism as opposed to try to circumvent that mechanism. All right, and our last story of the day, Log4Shell exploited to infect VMware Horizon servers. On Tuesday, researchers from Sophos revealed that the now infamous 10.0 severity RCE vulnerability Log4Shell is being actively exploited to deliver malware to unpatched VMware Horizon servers. The malware includes remote monitoring packages, backdoor implants, and crypto miners. It's really a trifecta. Although Log4Shell patches were released back in December 2021, Many internet facing servers have not yet been updated. So, Flea, my question about that last line patches are released, servers aren't updated. This is where so many stories that we've talked about today involve kind of people being tricked. Here we're seeing people not, you know, rolling out protections that are already readily available, or at least that's how it looks. I'm curious what's your take on this. Oh, man, this one is actually pretty complex because th there, there's the I want to assume good intentions. Right. For, mm -hmm. for, for humans in general. And, and so we, we have to remember that there are lots of companies that have tech and, and have Internet facing profiles that actually don't have tech teams. 
that don't have people that are actually there to patch and to manage. I love what we're actually seeing in some of the modern infrastructure and some of the modern you know, things that are actually being deployed such that end users and companies don't have to think about patching. Things actually self-remediate, self-update. Not everybody's on that bandwagon yet. And that is something we have to move towards in the future. However, there are also just legitimately lazy, bad companies. <laughs> and... Yeah, it, it, it should, you know, we, we have to also raise the stakes of being a crappy company. And if you don't care about your security, you don't care about your users. I mean, we have to figure out a way to make that extraordinarily painful in such a way that companies fear it more than they fear the SEC showing up at their door. They have to be incentivized to always treat security as a primary concern and make it front and center and to make sure it's actually pro properly staffed. So it's kind of twofold. It's like, hey, we have to do more in the just software industry to actually make this easier for, for people to actually self-remediate and, and quickly patch. And we also have to just really start laying the hammer down on people that fundamentally are just being lazy and unkind to their users. So don't be lazy and don't hate remediate. That's what I'm that's what oh, I'm taking away. Ah. <laughs> Don't but hate me. I'm stealing that, man. <laughs> you need but to print some t-shirts like, yeah. An Augusto t-shirt coming to you. So, Flea, before yeah. we get out of here, any story you reacted strongly to, a thumbs up or an eye roller? Yeah, so, so pr probably the thing that I reacted the most strongly to, obviously, was the, you know, Meta and Apple, et cetera, just, you know, disclosing information about, the, about their end users. And our relationship in the tech industry with law enforcement and vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I law enforcement is great. Um, it, it's a necessary thing that, that we have to have, you know, in, in society. Not saying we get rid of that, but they have to step up and they have to start carrying a stronger part of, of this burden. And it's silly that we have 18,000 different ways of running a police department. There should be one way of running a police department. It's silly that we're not requiring them to actually really come with a lot of evidence and proof. Um, you know, you kind of have that, that, that right to be, uh, you know, you're innocent until you're proven guilty. And we need to actually start enforcing that across the board, e even in, in cyberspace. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I think gave me the biggest eye roll it's like ah it, yeah it's like it's almost like these companies want to abdicate you know abdicate their responsibility of being good stewards of people's data i i couldn't have said it better flea thank you so much for being on the show frederick lee the CISO at gusto where can people find you if you are so inclined and is gusto hiring Oh, yeah. So um, I am very easy to find on LinkedIn um, via my, my government name, Frederick Lee. <laughs> um, you, you, you can also find find me on Twitter as well. Um, and, and it's Gusto Hiring. Yes, we are hiring. We, you know, we're hiring for every single position. And we're just looking for phenomenal people that are passionate about building a platform for small and medium-sized businesses, such as those small and medium-sized businesses get to focus on building their business as opposed to having to focus on some of the minutia around you know, managing and helping with people and building a delightful place to work at. All right. And where can people go to just uh, gusto.com? We'll have all yes. the listings for that. Right. Yes, gusto.com. And you can go to our career page and you'll see a lot of great things there. And you also get to meet some of the great people that actually work at Gusto. And hopefully you'll get just as excited and passionate about Gusto as I did when I first came across them. Fantastic. And of course, before we get out of here, we want to thank our sponsor, Veronis Zero Trust zero damage. Of course, come back next week for Super Cyber Friday, which will be all about hacking risk reduction, an hour of critical thinking about actions we should take to lower risk. That starts at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, as I prefer to think of it, followed by a meetup. And then we'll be back with another edition of the Week in Review. That's Fridays at 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 Eastern. Of course, you can still get your daily news fix through cybersecurity headlines every day. Give us about six minutes. We'll get you up to date. Until then, I'm Rich Straffolino reminding you, to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.